Hi everybody, it's Bob Zimmer, Member of Parliament again. I was in the House just uh, minutes ago debating C-21 and the entire basis of my argument is Bill C-21 actually makes our country less safe. Check it out. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Prince, Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll be sharing my time with the member who is right behind me, right behind me, the member from Yellowhead. So. Uh, a real opportunity to speak uh, against uh, Bill C-21, and the premise of my whole uh, uh, talk today will be uh, Bill, uh, Bill C-21 will actually make Canadians less safe. Um, as it spends uh, sparse resources in ways that are ineffective and targets law-abiding firearms owners instead of the real problem, which is gangs and guns in our inner cities. Um, a couple of things, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, just recently, um, actually a year ago, uh, the public safety uh, put forward a paper, uh, actually in 2018, reducing violent crime, a dialogue on handguns and assault weapons. And it, it, it starts off explaining what I'm trying to explain today, Madam Speaker. The vast majority of owners of handguns and other firearms in Canada lawfully abide by the requirements. And most gun crimes are not committed with legally owned firearms. Recent estimates indicate that there are about 900,000 handguns registered to individuals in Canada. In most cases, individuals own handguns either in the context of sports shooting activities or because those handguns form part of a collection. Any ban of handguns would primarily affect legal firearms owners. And Madam Speaker, it isn't just Conservatives that are saying this. It's the former uh, public safety minister himself who actually said he knows that handgun bans won't work. In a 2019 interview with the Global Mail, he said months of consultation has led him to the conclusion banning handguns would be costly and ineffective. Again, that's from the Liberal, former public safety minister across the way. Quote, I believe that would potentially be a very expensive proposition, but just as importantly, it would not, in my opinion, be perhaps the most effective measure in restricting the access that criminals would have to such weapons because we'd still have a problem with them being smuggled across the border. And Madam Speaker, I couldn't agree more. Um, that's why I find it strange that, you know, uh, the, the government it hasn't imposed a handgun ban previously. Uh, it's admitted that it's going to be ineffective and very expensive. And I think, the, again, the premise is, you know, even expensive, I think, I, I don't even necessarily want to speak to that because I think how can you quantify a, a life of one of our children? You can't, right? They're priceless. But let's actually deal with the problem then that really is going to save lives on our streets instead of uh, uh, prolonging the problem. So this is a, a quote from a police officer, Staff Superintendent Sean McKenna of Peel Regional Police uh, recently tweeted, Another illegally owned firearm seized by Peel Police. This is becoming a far too common occurrence in our community. A municipal, provincial, or federal ban on firearms will not stop criminals from carrying them. Root cause issues need to be addressed. Uh, exactly, Madam Speaker. And here's somebody that sees uh, the problems on the streets daily and knows where the real problem uh, lies. Another police officer. Uh, in my time, uh, Ron... Chinzer, and my apologies if I didn't get that name correct. In my time, quote, in my time in the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force, I don't recall ever, ever seizing a legally owned firearm from any of the investigations that I was involved in. The law-abiding population should never suffer or pay because of the unlawful criminal. And again, here is somebody that's actually on the street seeing this firsthand. Uh, probably, you know, and what I would, I'm going to talk about later is, how about we give those police officers better resources to deal with the, really the root problems? Uh, dealing with recidivism, uh, where uh, criminals get to, to walk free and commit crimes uh, all over again, and also not dealing with, with some of the root causes, what causes the violence in the first place. Another quote from another police officer, Steve Ryan. I investigated 150 homicides never seized one legally owned gun as a murder weapon. And he goes on, in my opinion, it makes more sense to ban legally owned kitchen knives and scissors. Those I have, have seized as murder weapons, banning legally owned guns won't decrease violence, root cause will. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, there's a consistent message coming from our police officers, isn't there today? 
uh, focus on, on the problem instead of a diversion, the law-abiding firearms co uh, community. Uh, this from the former OPP commissioner and uh, works for TTV, crime specialist Chris Lewis has been a very vocal opponent of wasting resources on gun bans. Uh, one quote uh, from Mr. Lewis. They aren't legally owned handguns, nor are they shotguns or hu and hunting rifles. Taking more guns from lawful owners and putting a toothless municipal handgun in place will, de will do the square root of sweet nothing, I'll say, because he uses another word, to impact violent crime. Um, and there it is, you know, former commissioner even saying the same thing. Uh, you know, and I guess, I'll go on. I have a few more quotes, Madam Speaker, and, and uh, we'll get into more discussion. I'm sure there'll be questions. Uh, the Deputy Chief of Toronto Police Service, uh, Myron Demkew, explained, the City of Toronto's experience is that guns are not from law-abiding citizens that are being used in crime. There are guns being smuggled in from the United States. Those engaged in handling those firearms are not law-abiding licensed gun owners. They are criminals with no firearms license. So, uh, you know, I'm a firearms owner. I have my RPAL. I know it's a very rigorous uh, uh, thing to purchase a firearm in Canada, whether it's a non-restricted firearm or restricted. It's very difficult. There's training that's involved. There's a vetting process that's involved, and every day, they look at our records to make sure that we can still legally and safely own our firearms. But I'll, I'll go on to a quote from uh, somebody that's very important, and this was part of uh, the recent study uh, that I, I that was public safety study uh, just recently. Uh, it's from Marcel Wilson. He's the founder and president of the One by One Movement, an organization founded by former gang members, extremists, and organized crime members to help identify, address, and research strategies on effective social programming for youth outreach. Uh, he explained, when speaking on gun control, when we hear the phrase, it should always be synonymous with illegal gun crime and illegal gun trafficking, as over 80% of the gun violence uh, we witness is committed with legal, Ill sorry, illegal firearms smuggled in from the U.S. So, I guess, Madam Speaker, I've I think, you know, it's not just been me. I always like to quote other individuals with a lot uh, better expertise than my own, actual police officers on the streets. We hear uh, this is from this uh, Marcel Wilson, a uh, Wilson, uh, former gang member, and really trying to fix the, the root problem of the, of the issue of kids dying on our streets uh, as, a, as a result of illegal firearms. And, and I think as conservatives, this is where we take quite a different position than the liberals across the way is that we conservatives actually support dealing with the real problem. You know, and when we saw a liberal long gun registry that cost $2 billion the last time, we have another Bill C-21 as part of resurrecting another long gun registry, and a confiscation regime, regime too, it's gonna be in the billions. And I just, my argument always back is just even take a fraction of that, that money, and put it into places where they're gonna be effective whether it's giving border agents better resources uh, to inspect containers as they cross the border. You know, instead of, you know, I don't even want to say the percentage of, of the containers that actually are inspected, but how about we triple that or even, you know, times 10 exponential uh, inspections, uh, actually, actually dealing with those firearms and stopping them right at the border. How about we give inner city police the tools to crack down on illegal firearms and gang activity? And also, how about we give resources to help these police officers deal with these young uh, gang members and try and get them out of those gangs and into productive lives. And also, Madam Speaker, we support Stop the Revolving Door that allows criminals who we even just saw recently with C5, you know, when the Liberals are wanting to let uh, people that are actually convicted of firearms crimes out the door uh, sooner than they should be, uh, just to recommit those crimes. Why don't we deal with all those situations and that will actually cause a real effect a real positive safety change on our inner cities and our streets. So uh, at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, I started off by saying this bill actually makes our country less safe. Uh, the Prime Minister touts it as something, it's, it's a bait and switch. Just because he's talking about guns and getting rid of them, he's not talking about the right guns to get rid of. Uh, he needs to get rid of the illegal farms on our streets. And once he starts tackling that and stop uh, misleading Canadians about what, what really will make a change, uh, my hope is that he'll finally realize that, but I see he uses this issue to divide Canadians. 
I would rather us tackle the real problem of illegal firearms on our streets. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Here, here. Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his speech and for mentioning the excellent study that the Public Safety Committee did on guns and gangs. And I just wonder if the Honourable Member is aware that the government is actually investing $250 million into community groups exactly like the One by One movement that the Honourable Member mentioned. By no means is this bill intended to be a the one solution for gun violence, it's meant to be comprehensive. Um, my question to the honourable member though is in Saskatchewan, the people who are dying are, uh, by firearms are actually white, rural, older men who are dying by suicide. And I'm just wondering if the honourable member supports the red flag provisions that are in Bill C-21. The honourable member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Well, I think Madam Speaker, uh, she, the member across the way highlights the problem. Uh, she said uh, 250 million to, to, to basically deal with uh, the issues when uh, in inner cities to really, uh, you know, uh, supporting uh, folks like Marcel Wilson, but it's a fraction of what's necessary. So she's talking about spending probably upwards of $5 billion on tackling the wrong problem, the problem that really doesn't exist because lawful firearms owners are not the problem. She's saying, well, let's keep spending that $5 billion and only spend $250 million on this other pr problem. Well, how about we spend all that money on what the real problem is? I think we'd be in agreement. You, we'd probably support the bill. But when, when they constantly say uh, we're going to protect Canadians by, by uh, uh, making laws more difficult for law-abiding firearms owners, it's just uh, um, ill-focused. Thanks. Here, here. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for San Diego School Finance. Because I know he's very knowledgeable as a gun owner, is there any part of C21 that he finds uh, useful as a reform that would be beneficial? I mean, if the bill will go to committee, where, where would we want to look for making amendments? Or for uh, Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to the question uh, from the member across the way. And I'll kind of answer it. I'll answer the previous uh, member's uh, question a little bit about on red flag laws. We already have a very robust system for checks and balances in our firearms owners uh, community. Mm -hmm. I, again, I'm a firearms owner. Every day my name gets sifted through uh, a database to see that I'm still capable and uh, safe to own firearms. Uh, that already happens. So uh, to have more applied to that, just to make it uh, more robust, uh, we already do have that. So th what I'm saying is, and maybe what the member is alluding to, uh, she might believe that it's necessary to have C21. I don't. I don't see anything that's uh, really a value in C21 to make Canada more safe. Again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a misleading of the country to say that he's the Prime Minister is doing something positive about firearms. He isn't. He could, and I wish he would. Here, here. Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the member for his, uh, his speech and evidence-based, uh, an evidence-based speech from investigators who have been investigating criminal activity, especially with firearms. My question for the member is, how did the government or why did the government start using evidence from maybe politicians to start looking at seizing legal firearms from legal firearm owners when that is not the problem, which you've clearly stated? For Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Well, well uh, thanks to the member for that question from Kootenay, Columbia. That, again, that's the mystery, isn't it? Uh, I don't see what the rationale is, and this is even from the, the, the Prime Minister himself. This is a quote. The long gun registry, as it was, was a failure, and I'm not going to resuscitate that. Mm -hmm. Another quote from this Prime Minister currently today. There are better ways of keeping us safe than that registry, which has been removed. So... You know, here's a, a, a person that is in our house today. He's bringing forward other rules, I, I believe, probably to divide Canadians. That's what he does, and that's how he wins. But if he really wants to actually crack down on illegal firearms crime and really make our streets safer in this country, he needs to, to, to look at what the Public Safety Committee's looked at and look at what some of the police officers are saying and what some of the, the anti-gang task force is actually saying to do and follow what they are saying to do. Do not spend those much of uh, scarce, much-needed resources on lo the law-abiding firearms community. Uh, we are not the problem. 